Welcome everybody to our church service today and we're glad that you're able to join us once again. Our last, last weekend I emailed out uh, the very sad news that Molly Carson, uh, a loved member of our church, passed away at the age of 95 and she was buried just a few days ago from Rulu Presbyterian. But a favourite favorite verse of Molly's was from Psalm 66. The last verse in Psalm 66 says, Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. God promises to always hear the prayer of the repentant sinner crying out for salvation. He always responds. He always says yes, and he saves. And he holds that person as his child for the rest of their life and right into eternity with that never-ending, never-ceasing, never-breaking, steadfast love. And so I want to begin our service by giving thanks to God for the life of Molly. Uh, Molly uh, settled things with God at the age of 21. As a young woman, she came to trust in Jesus. And for 74 years of her life, every day, Jesus walked with her. He never let her go. He held her every moment of all those days in the grip of his powerful and wonderful love. And we're thankful to God for that. We're thankful to God. That although we're sad that she's left, that she is now home in heaven with her Lord and Saviour. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a faithful God. We thank you that you know every one of your children. In fact, you know us better than we know ourselves. And despite the fact that you know us fully and you know all the, uh, the corners of our heart and the sin that dwells there, still you love us and no one loves us like you do. We thank you that you called us to trust in Jesus and to know the forgiveness of our sins through faith in him. Thank you that that has been true for Molly. And I thank you for the, how every day she was able to say uh, that you loved her and you're with her and that you helped her. And you have helped her all the way into eternity uh, to, to know and be with Jesus there. And Father, we do pray for her family. And we do pray that you will replace that hurt with healing. And we pray that you'll provide comfort. And uh, we pray especially for Henry and for Christine and for the grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Uh, Father, we pray that they will know you near with them uh, and that you will draw them uh, to, uh, to, to see Jesus as Molly did as well, that they might know his help uh, and his comfort too. And we pray that for ourselves. Father, we pray that you will speak to us uh, as Scott comes later in the service to preach. We pray that we will be challenged and encouraged, that we will see Jesus with new eyes, uh, and that we will be uh, in our affections stirred again uh, to, uh, to follow him. Our Father, we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to have our first song uh, this morning. Uh, and I just encourage you while you're at home to, to sing out and to sing uh, for the glory of God our Father.
Well, please, please lift your Bibles, and we're going to have our Bible reading just now. Uh, Scott, who is one of our elders, is preaching this morning. He's going to be preaching from John chapter 12, John chapter 12. So turn there with me. Kathleen is going to bring us our Bible reading, John chapter 12, verse 12. Uh, and then after that, uh, we're going to go into Tim and Sharon's house and we're going to have a short interview with Tim and hear what God has done in his life. The Bible reading today is from John chapter 12, verses 12 to 19. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat in it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's coat. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see, you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Amen. Hi, my name is Tim. I live in Larn with my wife Sharon, our 17 year old son Alex, our twin boys Lewis and Jake, age 14, and a cocker spaniel called Charlie. I originally came from a village known as Tombridge. Now, don't worry if you've never heard of Tombridge. I lived there for 25 years. And I'm still not sure that I've even heard of it. Um, I've had lots of different jobs over the years. I, I worked in an airport. I worked for a security firm. I, I rented properties. I've sold cars. Uh, but now I write children's books and I visit schools. Uh, but obviously I'm not here to advertise those. Sharon and I have been attending Larn Baptist Church for over 21 years now. Which is strange because uh, I'm only 26 years old. Well, I was brought up in a Christian home, so for me, the existence of Jesus was always just a fact. Um, I went to church and Sunday school and any gospel mission that was within a 20 mile radius. My grandfather was a lay preacher. My grandmother played organ in the church. So um, I accepted that Jesus was a real person in history from a, a very early age. Um, I believed he was the son of God. I, I believed he, he died for my sins. I believed he rose again. Uh, I believed he was the only way to be saved. Um, but I now know that believing in Jesus is not the same as trusting in him as your savior. Um, as it says in the book of James, even the demons believe in God. So while I accepted everything the Bible said about Jesus was true, I wasn't yet a Christian. Well, as I said, um, I was aware of the need to be saved, but um, I think there's a danger for those brought up in Christian homes to think that because they have Christian parents and uh, they go to Sunday school and they know their Bibles, they go to church, that they're automatically Christians. Uh, by some form of you know spiritual osmosis um, but uh, I'm afraid that just isn't the case and it took me a while to make that connection between other people's need for salvation that I was hearing preached about and my need for salvation 
Um, that finally happened one Sunday evening when I was around nine years old. My grandfather had just suffered a, a severe stroke and I remember talking to my sister about it and uh, I was very upset and I was crying but I realised it wasn't just about my grandfather. I, I think his, his illness made me sort of aware that at some point, well, I was going to die too. And if that happened at that moment, um, I wasn't going to go to heaven. Um, I was aware that something wasn't right in my relationship with God. Um, and maybe I didn't even have a relationship with God. And I remember that my mother rang our pastor and he came round to talk with me. And um, he just led me in a, in a very simple prayer to acknowledge my sin, um, to acknowledge my need for forgiveness. And I accepted Jesus into my heart uh, that night. And I don't remember an exact date. I've asked my mother and she assures me somewhere there is a, a piece of paper with the exact date. But the date doesn't matter because what does matter is I still clearly remember that feeling of a uh, tremendous release, that feeling of a burden being lifted. And I, I just had this uh, sudden overwhelming assurance that uh, my sins were forgiven and uh, I was saved. Well, that is a, a massive question, which would take a, a very long time to answer. Uh, but in essence, I, I would simply say that God has been incredibly faithful to me. Um, having that personal relationship with Jesus and also the amazing gift of prayer um, has helped me not just resist countless temptations, but also helped restore me uh, of the many times I have failed and many times I continue to fail and will fail. Um, and I, I'm aware I have no monopoly on suffering and uh, many people have been through much more difficult times than I have, but there have been struggles as with any life. Um, my sister suffered with uh, very poor health all of her life and was continually in and out of hospital. And she sadly passed away on the 4th of April, 2006. But even through her illness, God remained a source of strength and of comfort. Um, she was a Christian and seeing how God helped her cope with it uh, and cope with what was happening to her, that, that really helped me in turn. And I remember an occasion when we thought she wouldn't live until the morning. That's what the doctors were, were telling us. Um, but our church back in Grange, they just got together and uh, they held a, a prayer meeting and uh, she survived through the night and showed signs of improvement to the point where the, the non-Christian doctor said he had no earthly scientific medical explanation for what had happened. And even he called it a miracle. And of course, my parents jumped in to tell him about the prayer meeting. Uh, and uh, that was what they believe had, uh, had sustained her through the evening. And... Uh, over the years, my parents and my sister, though they had countless opportunities to witness to hundreds of doctors and hundreds of nurses and um, it allowed me to have conversations with non-Christian friends at school about what God had done. And that's just one example of God's faithfulness. Um, and there have been so many times when God has given me the strength to get through difficult situations. And this past year has, has obviously been tricky for everyone. I particularly struggled with homeschooling and, and the process of having to teach myself before I can teach my children. And if their teachers are watching, I apologize. If, if they have to reset their exams, it's probably my fault. Um, but one of the biggest challenges for us as a family this year, um, I suppose has been dealing with our oldest son, Alex, who is on the autism spectrum. Um, the change to his routine and the uncertainty about what was going on and, and also the uncertainty about the future, when were things gonna go back to normal? No one could answer that for him. Um, well, that caused him a lot of anxiety, which uh, in Alex can manifest itself in, in some very difficult ways. But um, I get back to that verse in Psalm 46, verse one, 
God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in time of trouble. And and I can testify to the, the truth of that verse. Again, we have seen God's faithfulness and that, that none of us uh, have been sick. Uh, many members of both Sharon's family and my own family have contracted COVID, but uh, God has brought them through it safely. Um, I'd also like to say we, we have uh, known great blessing through the teaching and the fellowship of our church uh, and through Pastor Simon. Um, and, you know, God can still work via Zoom and YouTube. Let me encourage you. Um, where we see limitations, God sees opportunities. Um, so, so, yes, um, God is faithful. Um, my message would very simply be that uh, God loves you. He, he proved that by sending Jesus to die on the cross in your place. Um, one of the best known verses in the Bible is, is of course, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that uh, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And, uh, you know, there's maybe no better verse in summing up God's love for you. Um, what it cost him to span that gap, sin placed between us and him. Um, also the lost eternity he saves us from, uh, as well as the heavenly reward uh, we receive. So to someone who isn't a Christian, I'd say God loves you. I would say place yourselves in that verse. Say, for God so loved me that he gave his one and only son for me, that if I believe in him, I won't perish but I'll have everlasting life. Um, and you know, that's what I had to do. It's one thing to believe that Jesus' sacrifice was for everyone, but it's actually another to believe that it was for me. That sounds strange, but it's true. Um, and to believe that my salvation depended on me actually doing something about it, um, that I had to choose to accept God's gift of grace. And... Becoming a Christian is the most important decision you will ever make and it's the only one you're guaranteed to never regret. It uh, doesn't mean your life will suddenly be so much easier. In fact, it, it may even become more difficult, um, but it does mean you won't go through it alone. And becoming a Christian is it, more important than any earthly ambition you may have or any uh, relationship you might have. Um, I would just say to someone who isn't a Christian, you know, God loves you. God is faithful like no other and, and he loves you like no other.
yes, yes, that's right. I remember that very well. Yes, okay. Well, um, look, uh, oh, I've got to go. I've got to go. All right. Bye. See you now. Bye bye. Boys and girls, uh, I'm glad. I'm glad you're there. Sorry about that. I was just uh, on the phone. These are great things, aren't they? Do you know uh, when I need to talk to someone, I can pick this up and I can ring them at any time. Uh, and when they need to talk to me, they can pick up their phone and this will buzz and I can talk to them at any time. That's great. It's great being able to be so accessible and able to talk. But do you know there sometimes I pick up my phone. <gasps> I've got missed calls. Oh, I missed I missed talking to so and so. Or sometimes I pick it up to phone someone and they don't answer. And and that can be frustrating. So it's great to be able to talk, but sometimes we get frustrated when we can't get through to someone. But prayer is not like that. Okay, we've been learning that over the last few weeks. Prayer is being able to talk to God anytime, anywhere. And he always listens. He always hears and he always answers so it's good to talk to god but i want to share some tips to help you do that okay we're going to take the word talk t-a-l-k and we're going to begin with t t okay here's some tips to help you to pray take time take time okay we we have lots of things to do in the day don't we uh, but we need to take time to pray you take time to brush your teeth at least i hope you do Okay, and you do that every day, twice a day, and that's really good. But you need a habit of prayer to take the same time every day to pray. You can pray, of course, at any point when you're out and about. You can say one sentence in your mind. You don't even have to pray out loud. But to have a special time where you take time to speak to God in prayer. So that's T. A, that's a bit of a silly one, but uh, that's what I say. When there's peace and quiet in the house. Ah, I've got a quiet space and I can think clearly. That's great. So find a quiet space when you go to talk to God. Um, now remember you can talk to him in a busy street in any place. But for that special time that you have every day, find a quiet space. Maybe it's hard to do that. Uh, turn off the TV, turn off the PlayStation, Xbox, whatever it is. Uh, get away from your brother and sister. Build a fort if you have to. But find a quiet place where you can think. And you can talk to God just for a few moments. So take time. Ah, quiet. Find a quiet place. And then L, learn from God's word. Learn from God's word. That's what we've been doing over the last few weeks. We've taken the Lord's Prayer to help us to learn how to pray. So that we can pray less selfishly. So why don't you do that? Take the Bible and read a little bit of it and then talk to God about it. And then K, this is the last one. Keep a note. Keep a note. You could have a little notebook and you could write down, I'm praying about this, praying about this, praying about this. And you know what? After a few weeks, you'll be able to look back and you'll be able to see, God answered that prayer. That's right. I was praying about that. And then God did this. And you could actually go through all those notes and you could say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. But there are some little tips to help you to pray. Now, we've been learning the Lord's Prayer from Matthew chapter 6. If you have been able to follow that with us and you've learned it, get your parents to record a short video clip of you saying it from memory. And get them to send it to me on WhatsApp or Messenger. And if I can see that, uh, and I can see that you've learned it, uh, there will be a prize coming to your door uh, and uh, I'm not sure what it is but it'll be very very good okay so make sure you do that well boys and girls I'm looking forward to being able to see you hopefully next Sunday uh, and it'll be good to be together uh, again we're going to sing again uh, and then after this song as uh, Scott uh, an elder from the church is going to come and open God's word with us so let's sing together
Good morning. It's Palm Sunday, the day we remember the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem five days before he was crucified and seven days before he rose again from the dead. The life of Jesus was a remarkable life. And as he lived it, he drew attention to himself. If you're a photographer, or if you're taking a photograph, you have to bring the camera to the image you want to take or to the object that you want to take. You have to bring it into focus. And then after you've taken the photograph, you scrutinize it. Are there any details that blemish the photograph? Are their eyes closed? Or is it out of focus? Or is anybody sticking out their tongue? And it might be if any of those details are present, that you simply discard the photograph and get rid of it. On the other hand, if everybody's eyes are open and everybody's smiling and all tongues are in the mouth and everybody's in focus, then it might be that's a photograph that you will keep and maybe cherish, or if you're lucky, possibly sell. And during the life of Jesus, his works, his words, his teaching, his preaching, his compassion, his mercy and grace, the miracles and the signs and the wonders that he performed, all of these things increasingly brought the attention of people upon him. And as, they, as their attention fixed on him, they focused on him, and as they focused on him, they increasingly scrutinized him. And so questions that arose were, who was Jesus? Or what was his purpose? Or what should our response be to him? Good questions. Who was Jesus? What was his purpose? And what should our response be to him? Questions which are still relevant today. William Shakespeare uh, wrote a poem, The Seven Ages of Man. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms, then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face creeping like snail unwillingly to school. It doesn't sound like things have changed too much since William Shakespeare's day, regarding raising children. But William Shakespeare's poem continues through the teenage years um, and adult and senior adult all the way to frail adult. Enjoy Jesus' life can't be analyzed in terms of the seven ages that Shakespeare speaks of. He didn't live beyond middle age. But Jesus Christ did visit Jerusalem and the temple seven times that are recorded in the gospel. He may have visited Jerusalem and the temple more, but seven of those times are recorded in the gospels. And it's these that we're going to think about this morning. What do these visits tell us about who Jesus was, what his purpose was, and what our response should be? Jesus' first visit to the temple and to Jerusalem was when his parents took him at the age of maybe a month old. And as the parents arrived in Jerusalem to present Jesus at the temple to, to observe the law in the Old Testament, they were greeted by Simeon. And Simeon was an old man, an old man who loved God, served God, worshiped God. And when he beholds this child, he takes the child in his arms and he says something very remarkable. Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. One of my children was telling me about a video that was promoted to them uh, during the week on an educational basis. 
And it was a video called The Good Death or A Good Death. I think it was coming from a medical ethics point of view. And Hannah asked me what I thought makes a good death. And I said, peace. And what do I mean by that? I think all of us would want a peaceful death, physically peaceful, not being tormented by nausea or by pain. Peace with our loved ones, all relationships mended, no regrets, and, and surrounded by those we love uh, with nothing at odds. And spiritual peace, knowing that when we stand before God, we are at peace with him and not at odds with him. And so here, when Simeon holds this child, this one month old baby, he says, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Simeon had been promised by God that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Christ, the promised anointed one. And he had been waiting all these years for the Messiah, for the Christ to come. And now he is holding this Christ in his arms. And this Christ, this baby, is remarkable because this baby would deliver the salvation that God had planned. The salvation that God had planned. Not just for the Jews, but for all peoples. For all peoples that you have prepared in the presence of of all peoples. And so who is Jesus Christ? From his first visit to the temple, we see that he is the promised Christ. He is the fulfillment of God's promises, according to your word, says Simeon. And he is the one who will bring salvation. A remarkable salvation in that it allows people to depart in peace. In knowing the salvation of Jesus Christ, we can depart in peace. The second visit of Jesus uh, to the temple that we read of in the Gospels was when he was 12 years old. It was Passover uh, festival and after the Passover his parents and the group they were traveling with left Jerusalem to go home and Jesus remained behind with everybody else unaware that he was still there. And as we read down through the passage in Luke chapter 2, Mary and Joseph eventually find him after three days and they say, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. For 12 years, they have been living a relatively normal family life. Joseph as Jesus' father, Mary as Jesus' mother, and when they're looking for him in Jerusalem, behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And Jesus says to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Who is Jesus Christ? There's something remarkable we see here because we have a 12-year-old boy who is growing in strength and growing in stature. He is human, fully human. But at the same time, we have Jesus Christ who can call God his father. When Gabriel visited Mary before Jesus was born, she said he would be called the son of the most high. Jesus Christ is the son of the most high. He was able to address God as his father. And when the Jews heard this, they understood that he was making himself equal with God. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Jesus Christ is the savior. But who is Jesus Christ? He was fully man, but he was also fully God. God the son who came down from heaven to dwell in a body that he had prepared for himself. The first two times that Jesus went to the temple, he was taken by his parents. But the third time he was taken by the temple was during his temptations by the devil. And the third temptation, Jesus was taken to the pinnacle of the temple and the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. The devil knew he was the son of God. Jesus Christ knew he was the Son of God. 
And yet all through Jesus' life, his brothers didn't believe him. We're told that in the Gospel of John. And as we read through the Gospel of John, the town in which he grew up in would ultimately not believe him either. How tempting it might have been to use one's power to convince, to prove, to demonstrate one's deity, to use and abuse one's power to force others to believe. And yet Christ did not yield to that temptation. He would not be prompted by pride. He would not be prompted uh, by vanity. He would not be prompted by Satan. He would be prompted by his Father alone. He was here to do his Father's will. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me. And so through these temptations of Jesus, Jesus remained blameless. He remained sinless. And as we read on through the Gospels and through into the letters of Paul, we find that Paul writes that he was obedient to the point of death from the point of birth through his life to the point of death on the cross. He committed no sin. He was sinless and he was spotless. The unblemished Lamb of God. Jesus' fourth visit that we read of in in the Gospel of John, is early in his ministry. And in John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22, uh, the Passover is at hand, and Jesus goes up to Jerusalem, and he visits the temple, and when he goes there, he finds those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and money changers sitting there. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? What sign do you show us for doing these things? What authority do you have? You're not a temple guard. You're not temple police. You're not Roman soldiers. Who do you think you are to do these things? This is a a sort of a, a little mock of a Metropolitan Police card. But the Metropolitan Police Identity Cards say this is the warrant and authority for executing the duties of their office. And that's what these men wanted to know. They wanted to know what authority and warrant Jesus had for clearing the temple. What sign will you give us? It's interesting as you read down through the same passage, later on it says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. He demonstrated his authority by the signs he was doing. And yet they wanted more. And Jesus spoke of one sign specifically. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Speaking of his body, destroy this body, you kill this body and in three days I will raise it up. He would do something that would set himself apart from all the godly prophets of old. They also committed and performed miracles but none of them could lift and raise their lives again after death. But Jesus Christ could, and Jesus Christ would, and Jesus Christ did. And so Paul can say in Romans chapter 1 that Jesus Christ was of the line of David according to the flesh, but was declared by power according to the Spirit to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. By what authority do you do these things? By the sign that I am the Son of God, that I am God the Son. I am the ultimate authority. This is my temple. And so Jesus Christ had the authority to say what was acceptable and unacceptable, what was right and what was wrong, what was acceptable worship and unacceptable worship. Jesus Christ would go on to say, if you do not honor the Son as you honor the Father, you do not honor God. If you do not honor Jesus as you honor God, you do not honor God. And so what authority had Jesus? He has ultimate authority, not just over the Jews, not just over the temple, but the world is his and all people are his and to all and and all people owe 
their allegiance and their obedience to him. Jesus' fifth visit to the temple. If you imagine Jerusalem, it was a heaving, busy city. And in that city, there were those who had various ailments and complaints, various illnesses and weaknesses. Where would they go? Where should they go? And many gathered at the pool of Bethesda. Bethesda means the house of mercy or the house of grace. And so those in need would go to the place of mercy or to the place of grace. When Jesus arrives in Jerusalem on this occasion, he doesn't go to the leaders of the Jews. He doesn't go to the palace of Herod. He doesn't go to the, the palace of Pilate. Jesus goes to the place where people are looking for mercy and grace because he is a compassionate saviour. And there he meets a man who has been paralysed for 38 years and he asks the man, do you want to be healed? The man mustn't have known who Jesus was. He doesn't seem to have any faith in Jesus to be do, able to do anything miraculous. And so instead of looking to Jesus, he looks to this mystical pool and he puts his faith in the mystical pool and he says, I have no way of getting there in time. I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up and while I'm going another steps down before me. And Jesus speaks words of power and compassion and mercy and grace. Get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Jesus Christ is the Savior. Jesus Christ is God the Son. Jesus Christ has ultimate authority. But Jesus Christ is one who is compassionate and gracious and merciful and loving. And to him we can turn. And he will act. He says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus' sixth visit to the temple was in secret. Pharisees had come to Jesus and said, Herod is trying to kill you. The leaders of the Jews were trying to kill him and arrest him. How could he get to the feast? How could he get to the temple? And he couldn't. Not in public. They would have stopped him on the way. And so Jesus arrives halfway through this feast without anybody knowing he was there or knowing who he was. And here is Jesus and he arrives in Jerusalem secretly, not with his followers, not with his disciples, not with crowds adoring him. And will he stand out as someone remarkable? Well, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went in, up into the temple and began teaching. And people began asking questions as they listened to him. How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? And then the penny dropped. Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly and they say nothing to him. And more questions followed. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? And finally, in John chapter 7, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? You know, the equality, the authority of Jesus Christ was recognized with all the hype and hysteria that maybe followed him to other towns and villages and through the countryside. He simply spoke and he was recognized for the authority that he was. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. I've been to one or two uh, cities at night, and at night they look fantastic. At night, they're beautifully lit up. Huge screens on the sides of buildings, beautiful shop fronts lit up. Lots of life uh, going about in the streets, and it looks beautiful. 
But the following morning, when you go back to the same place, you wouldn't recognize it. The lights are all turned off. The screens look dim in the daylight. And the background buildings are horrible concrete and look dilapidated and the streets look filthy and the streets look dirty. And it's a different appearance when the light shines on it. And Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He is the light to the Gentiles. He is a light that shines into our lives. And apart from him, we can convince ourselves that everything is beautiful in the dark. Everything is fine and everything is dandy. But when we stand in the light and we see the real condition of ourselves and our lives and our society and our culture and the world, we see a huge shortfall that must trigger questions in our minds like these people asked. Can it be that this is the Christ? When the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? And so Christ, as he shines his light into our lives, demands that we think, demands that we assess his life, his words, his works, his deeds. Think. We've reached the seventh and final visit of, of Jesus to Jerusalem and the temple that is recorded in the Gospels. And what a transformation happens over the course of this week. When Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, he is greeted with such fanfare and celebration. John 12, verse 13, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Such fanfare. And yet how things would change over the coming week. We thought about photographs earlier. You, you bring your camera to the image, you focus on the image, you take the photograph and you scrutinize it. And after scrutiny, do you discard it or do you keep it? And for all these years, the people of Israel and the people of Jerusalem have given their attention to Jesus. They've focused on him, they've scrutinized him, and now a decision has to be made. Will they discard him or will they follow him? Well, the Jewish leaders, they conspired to arrest him and to have him killed. And ultimately, Jesus found himself standing before Herod, who showed him contempt and decided not to, uh, to rescue him, but handed him over to Pilate. And Pilate examined him and found no wrong in him. He found Jesus to be innocent and did not rescue him, but handed him over to the crowd. And the crowd, they had a choice between Barabbas, guilty of insurrection and murder, or of Jesus their promised Christ and Savior, the King of Israel. And they chose Barabbas. And of Jesus they cried, crucify him, crucify him. It might sound as though the crucifixion of Jesus was a failure of his ministry. But Jesus Christ throughout his ministry indicated that he would be arrested, that he would be crucified, and more importantly, that he would rise again. It wasn't a failure of Christ's ministry that he was crucified. Jesus Christ came knowing he would be crucified. It was to fulfill God's word, to fulfill the plan of God for the salvation of those who would trust in him. John the Baptist at the start of the ministry said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin, sin of the world. Jesus Christ was that sacrifice who would take away the sin of the world. He himself would bear our sins on his body on the cross. The punishment that would bring us peace, writes, in, writes Isaiah, would be upon him. The Bible says, that he loved us and washed us from our sin by his own blood. And so Jesus goes before us into death by crucifixion, but he goes before us into life by resurrection, and he ascended to be at the Father's right hand. And he is coming again. 
And we've considered that he is the one with ultimate authority. He has ultimate authority and we will stand before him. And we will give account for our choices. He requires us to choose. He requires you to choose as the people of Jerusalem had to choose. And so when we consider his life through these seven visits to Jerusalem and to the temple, from a child to his death, as we've considered his teaching and his compassion and his authority and his deity and his humanity, what will your choice be? I hope you will choose to follow him. Thank you for listening. Amen.